Okay, so in this problem, we've looked at uh, the reactions, we figured out what the axial force diagram is using a couple different methods. We then went on to look at the displacements uh, at point D, so we had to calculate what all the displacements were between A and B, B and C, C and D to add them up to get the displacement at point D. But one of the, the viewers noted that we at no point calculated the internal stresses in the rod. And so I made equipment that I would just very quickly go back and calculate the stresses for the different points in the rod. And because the internal loads are changing, we all have to calculate uh, independently the stress between A and B, the stress between B and C, and the stress between C and D. So I've set the problem up, and what I want to do here is uh, the basic uh, equation that we're going to be working with is the stress, which is a normal stress, so we'll use uh, sigma is equal to the load denoted by P divided by its cross-sectional area A. So we're going to step through, we're going to look at it in each individual section, so we'll start by looking at the stress between A and B. And that will be equal to the load between A and B divided by uh, the area. And I, I'll say between A and B, obviously the area is going to be constant between A and B, B and C, C and D. But in other problems that might, might not be true. So I'll just put that down there just as a reminder that you, you want to make sure that you're using the area for the section you're calculating. So we go over to our... Axial force diagram, we're interested in the internal load to calculate the internal stress. So from our axial force diagram, not from our free body diagram or anywhere else, we see here that the axial force diagram between A and B is a constant 5 kilonewtons. And I'll put that in in newtons, 5,000 newtons, and I do that because that's going to work out really nice with my areas, which we have calculated in millimeters squared, uh, to give me a unit system which is predictable and divided by its area, which we have calculated up above 490.9 millimeters squared. Calculate that out, it comes to 10.2. Uh, so that's newtons per millimeter squared. We know a newton per millimeter squared is a megapascal, which is very convenient for most uh, material evaluations. And it's positive, and that may, means that it is in tension. So I'll denote that there so that there can be no confusion. And then that's basically what we need to do. I'm just going to very quickly go on, repeat that calculation between B and C, C and D will be done. So the stress then between B and C is equal to the load between B and C divided by the area BC. Now again, from our axial force diagram, we see that the load between B and C is negative 3 kilonewtons or negative... 3,000 newtons. The area has not changed. So 490.9 millimeters squared. And I've done that calculation out and it comes to a negative 6.1 megapascals. Now because it's negative, we know that that is in compression. Stress CD is equal to load CD, area CD, and again back from our axial force diagram we see negative 7,000 newtons for our internal load, 490.9 millimeters squared, calculates out to negative 14 point, oh pardon me, negative 14.3 megapascals. Again negative, so we see that it is in compression. And so if you look at the three values, you can see that the largest axial or, or normal stress would be occurring between C and D, where we have the largest axial load, and that is a value of negative 14.3 megapascals in compression. And that's it. That's all there is to it. A simple application of the stress equals P over A, and that completes that problem with a calculation of the internal stresses in the three sections of the rod.